Welcome yeah. back from me, Susan Sharp, to our music programmes on Radio 3. Time now for our weekly exploration of the BBC Sound Archive, Mining the Archive. Scarlatti's Sonata La Pastorale, played there by the subject of this week's Mining the Archive, the Italian pianist Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. Michelangeli died a year ago this week at the age of 75, after a number of years of fairly indifferent health. He leaves behind him a mere handful of commercial recordings, notably discs of Debussy and Chopin, and an all-time classic of the gramophone, his 1957 recording of the Rachmaninoff Fourth and Ravel G Major piano concertos. For its part, the BBC archive possesses valuable Michelangeli recordings dating back to 1957, and including works which represent the cornerstones of the solo and piano concerto repertory, Beethoven's Opus 111 Sonata, Chopin's B-flat minor Sonata, Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit and G major Concerto, and Debussy's First Book of Preludes. Over the next couple of weeks, I'll be dipping into the archive and playing some of the earlier of the BBC's Michelangeli recordings. Michelangeli's all too infrequent recital and concert appearances were red-letter days for all piano fanciers who packed into the Royal Festival and later the Barbican Halls and amongst the throng was always a goodly collection of Michelangeli's fellow pianists who'd come to see the extraordinary man behind the myth and to revel in his apparently inexhaustible range of tone colours and marvel at the clarity of his articulation. Some claimed that Michelangeli's technique had become an end in itself, that the music had been stripped of its poetic heart, while for others Michelangeli's style represented something new something somehow ideally suited to the post-war, post-romantic world of the second half of the 20th century. We'll begin our quest for the Michelangeli legacy with a commercial recording made soon after the war, his breathtaking performance of Brahms' Variations on a Theme by Paganini. Brahms' Variations on a Theme by Paganini, recorded in London in 1948 by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. Legend has it that after a suitable time for his warm-up, Michelangeli sat down at the piano in his unusually low position and recorded that performance in a single take. After he'd finished, he got up, put his coat on and made for the door, only to be intercepted by a sound engineer who was worried about the sound balance at one place. With his customary shrug, Michelangeli returned to the piano, the tape rolled again and he played the whole work exactly as he had done the previous time, and the reading that we've just heard is one or other of these unedited takes. Well, this story is just an innocent example of the kind of legend that's grown up around Michelangeli. With his demonic manner and his cadaverous appearance on stage, he had an almost Faustian demeanour and an aura of nearly religious mystique. Rumour had it that he'd been a fighter ace in the Italian Air Force, that he'd worked for the anti-fascist resistance movement, that he was a champion racing driver, that he'd qualified as a doctor, and even that he could trace his ancestry back to St Francis of Assisi. To help me unravel the mystery, the enigma that was Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, I spoke with two people who in their own ways know as much about him as anybody. His family friend and pupil for eight years, the London-based pianist and teacher Noretta Conchi, and the Milanese pianist Carlo Palese, who's recently had a major part in organising an important Michelangeli exhibition in the pianist's native town of Brescia, a task which involved him in scores of interviews with Michelangeli's friends, helpers and colleagues. Our journey begins some ten years before Michelangeli recorded the Brahms Paganini variations we've just heard and in a country whose landscapes were rather different from the hills and mountains around Brescia. It was in 1938 that Michelangeli first achieved some sort of official international recognition when he came seventh in the Queen Elizabeth competition in Brussels. Well, this may sound like a very modest start to a career, but it's worth remembering that Michelangeli was 18 and at least five years younger than any of his fellow competitors. He'd put down a useful marker and impressed the jury with his exceptional control of sonority and his extraordinary keyboard facility. It was in the following year, 1939, that the decisive break came,
when Michelangeli stunned an impressive international jury, including both Paderewski and Alfred Cotto, at the Geneva competition, which was then one of a mere half-dozen or so important competitions worldwide. Michelangeli's win in Geneva was decisive and clear-cut, and Alfred Cotto, whose own style of piano playing was light years away from that of this young North Italian, declared, famously and imaginatively, a new list is born. Here was a 19-year-old Italian to outshine the finest products of the hothouse conservatoires of Vienna, Berlin, Paris and Moscow. Carlo Palese took me through the various stages in Michelangeli's early career. I would say that, you know, the, the, the background of Michelangelo's studies was uh, completely Italian. I mean, he was completely Italian school because uh, he had studied when he was a little child, since when he was five or six, in Brescia, his town, with Paolo Chimeri, who was uh, an old teacher then uh, living there. And there he studied in a little music school called, was called the Liceo Venturi, and there he had his first performances when he was a little a little baby, let's say, <laughs> seven years, eight years. <laughs> After that, he was noticed and he was sent to a, a school in Milan of Giovanni Anfossi, who was another very important Italian teacher, a completely Italian school, I mean. And uh, he was an, an important teacher because he applied the, the new theories coming from uh, Breithaupt, it was an important German teacher about, you know, the, the use of weight on playing on a, you know, on a, on a grand piano keyboard. We should say that musically he is completely a product of the Italian school. Can you just describe what you would say was the Italian tradition? Well, Italian tradition in music, in piano, is not a very old one because you know that uh, the roots of a tradition in uh, 19th century is uh, on opera. And uh, there was an important school, which was from Naples. You know, Thalberg, uh, who was a pupil of Liszt, went to live in Naples and there founded a, a big school. Uh, so let's say that the roots are not properly Italians, but you know, there was a, some uh, attendance to mediate, which uh, the one was, was the cantability, the, the singing style of Italian opera with a new technique, the, the technique of, of the piano. But so, so this um, connection with Liszt, so it was very opposite that Cotto said uh, there's a new Liszt here when, when uh, he won that competition. Yeah, because um, you, you know that what maybe should have, you know, strike people when Liszt played was the, the powerful uh, control he had of the keyboard and uh, was an impression of somebody who was not in the, in the human kind. Something, superhuman. Uh, yeah, superhuman. Mm. And I think Michelangeli uh, should make people think uh, sort of the same thing. And he said he's born a new list, not a new Chopin or a new Busoni, but a new list because it's, it's something to point out the, the stunning way of yeah. playing he had. And uh, um, Michelangeli looked a little bit like Liszt, didn't he, really? Well... <laughs> His long hair and... Well, Slightly demonic. Yeah, I think I think you know in, in the later years he had this kind of look because he had you know as you told long, long hair like a little bit the this kind of uh, images of Liszt when he was uh, when he had already taken the vows and uh, yeah that's sort of <laughs> <laughs> an image. Yeah. Well, that was that competition was 1939. Yeah, 1939. Um, so he was all set for a, a wonderful career. And then the war came. Yeah, the war came, but... Uh, so then what happened? I think he was, uh, he was lucky because he had been very much appreciated during the, the concerts following this, uh, this big competition by... And this is a story. I mean, maybe it's, it's true. I mean, it's true that uh, the Princess Maria José of Piemonte listened to him. She was very powerful. And uh, they say, gossip says, <laughs> she, he had um, the possibility, you know, to go under the army, but without, uh, without going to the war, because, uh, because he continued keeping concerts all over Italy. And uh, those, there are also something important things about uh, repertoire yeah. I, I can point but, out in, about this earlier. But also in, in the war, just before we get to that, um, there, there is a story that he, that he fought as a fighter pilot and also that later on he was yeah. in the resistance. Well, uh, no, that but, no, but, nobody can confirm that. 
I, I can't say it's true or it's not true, but I don't think he was a pilot. Nobody knows something about that. Everybody knows this story, but nobody knows <laughs> it's true, you know. Mm, yes. And, but actually, I think he, di he didn't take part of the war. Mm. And we know that he was prisoned one day because there was, uh, after the 8th of September, 44, the, um, he was uh, one night in jail with, a, with a, a friend and pupil of his, Vincenzo Pertile, who I had the possibility to interview. But uh, no more, I think maybe this, this is one of the, the only participation in, the, you know, in all the act of war. Yes. <laughs> well, you were just about to mention the sort of repertoire that Michelangelo was playing around this time. Well, um, it, th this is a very um, important point. We see that uh, in the first years, at, to my opinion, he had all you know the the right papers to show himself as a big virtuoso. Because there are some pieces like Islamé by Balakirev, in example, or Dance Russe, the last movement of uh, three movements of Petrushka by Stravinsky, and uh, some uh, to a couple of preludes of Rachmaninoff which are, you know, very, you know, oneself show pieces just to, to, yeah. to show virtuosity. That's all, there's something else. I mean, but this means that he was very sensible to the possibility of catching the public. And uh, 42, 43, there was uh, already sort of a Michelangelo mania. And people were, you know, went crazy for Michelangelo's concerts. And wasn't he playing... Um quite a lot of Baroque music at that time. Yeah, yeah. He was playing a lot of Baroque music. In example, uh, the, the, he played Bach, he played uh, Concerto Italiano by Bach, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a lot of uh, clavicembalist uh, yeah. composers like Grazioli, Galuppi, Scarlatti. Scarla he loved that music because, you know, he had possibility to show his... Uh, Perfect, is marvelous, stunning control of uh, of sonorities and of uh, sound plans. And Mozart was quite unusual then, wasn't it? And Clementi. Yeah, Clementi. He played Clementi, and this is a very important point because uh, he thought, like a lot of musicologists now have to admit, that in the developing of uh, of of piano instrumental setting, are very important works of, of Clementi, because you know. In Clementi, we find uh, the, all the important points of new technique. We should say that Beethoven took much more, pianistically talking, from Clementi than from Mozart or Haydn. Well, Maestro Palese, let's hear one of the works by Clementi which Michelangeli championed. Here he is in a 1957 performance of the Sonata No. 2 in B-flat. It was recorded just a few yards away from where I'm sitting, in the intimate surroundings of the Concert Hall of Broadcasting House here in London. The Sonata No. 2 in B-flat by the Italian-born but later London-based composer and piano manufacturer Maurizio Clementi. In Mining the Archive so far today, we've heard quite a bit from Carlo Palese about Michelangeli the pianist, but we're still not much closer to unravelling the mysteries of Michelangeli the man. To help me do this, I paid a visit to Noreta Conchi. She was a close friend throughout the 1950s. We started our conversation by looking at one of her lovely photographs of Michelangeli, which were taken by a local photographer who also happened to direct the local choir. This was a photograph taken, I imagined, in 1957. This is um, when his father died and... Uh there is a convent near Arezzo where he used to have his uh, master classes in the summer, every August, for many, many years, like 10 or 12 years. And uh, his best, best friend, most loved friend, was Padre Vigilio. And here he is with the Padre And here he is with Padre Vigilio, and he used to take us out up there in turns and introduce us to Padre Vigilio. And um, he was really uh, a mystic sort of figure, and he, he loved to go there. And uh, Michelangelo was a mystic. Michelangelo was a mystic figure, I think, very much so, yes. And he used to like to go up and be and quiet. That's right, be quiet and then have long talks and long walks with uh, Padre Vigilio. He looks here, obviously, because his father had recently died, but he looks sad. Was he? Yes, he was. And was he? Was By he... nature, he was really quite a sad sort of person. Although he, he loved to, uh, to play ping pong or driving the car or playing cards or to, to 
to go for walks, etc. He was very good in playing. Whatever he did, he, he did it um, remarkably professionally, but uh, I cannot say that he was a happy sort of figure, except possibly when, when he was playing and when he was teaching, of course. Did he suffer from depression? Was he a sort of... No, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. He was just... Very melancholy. Mm -hmm. That's a very good mm. word, yes. Well, you, you mentioned his driving. That was a real passion of his, wasn't it? It was. It was a great Tell passion me about that. of his. Well, <laughs> he used to, to have these extraordinary uh, racing cars, mostly Ferraris. In fact, all Ferraris. In my days, it was only Ferrari that he drove. And he drove at great speed and with really with a talent. <laughs> He even uh, told us, and I can't um, vouch for it exactly, but he told us that he uh, participated to the Mille Miglia. Probably that was before I knew him, but uh, I quite believe he did because he, he was incredible. <laughs> did he spend a long time fine-tuning his engine? Um, sorry. Uh, not really. He I, not I, really. He spent I, much more time uh, tuning his piano <laughs> <laughs> underneath his piano. And oh, I'd heard that he he worried as much about uh, the cylinders of his Ferraris as he did almost about the tuning of his piano. No, I wouldn't <laughs> say that. I think that the piano had priority. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> he he would without with his uh, incredible noisy Ferrari and would come up to our summer house, which is a thousand meters high. There's a picture here. And we have, on this particular occasion... <coughs> uh, he's being I, very sociable here. Yes, I managed to get the whole uh, Coro della Sat, Società Alpinisti Trentini, about 20 gentlemen, which... Uh, a male voice choir, in fact. Male voice choir, that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he absolutely loved what they did, and uh, so much so that he offered to harmonize a few songs, and they, of course, loved it all, and they uh, indeed recorded it eventually. Well, I think we must hear one. It will be fun. Which uh, one shall we have? Uh, well, I thought uh, perhaps La Brandolina and uh, Lucia um, Maria. Right, and um, there are two uh, Piemontesi songs. Mm -hmm. a comic ballad from Turin about a bride who's presented with a cask of wine instead of a ring, and Lucia Maria, a comic riddle about three young girls. They were sung there on Loretta Conci's much-played record by the Società Alpinisti Tredentini. The novel and highly pianistic harmonisations were by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, the subject of this and next week's Mining the Archive. An important area of Michelangeli's activities as a pianist was his teaching. It seems to have assumed for him the nature of a vocation, an act of love even. All his pupils, Maurizio Pollini, Marta Argerich and Jörg Demus amongst them, testified to the fact that he refused ever to accept any money from a pupil. Let the public pay to hear me play, he'd declare, as he embarked on another gruelling month's teaching at his famous classes in Arezzo. He usually had about 16 to 20 students, according to the number of pianoforti that he had in this uh, beautiful palazzo that he, he would uh, have put at his disposal. And uh, we had each one room and one piano. And uh, the schedule was like that, six of us or, or eight or 10, according to the number of, uh, of piano would start practicing at 8 o'clock in the morning until 12. Then the, the next slot would come at 12, from 12 to 4, and then us again from 4 to midnight, uh, f uh, from 4 to 8, sorry. And then the second lot from 8 to midnight. Now, he would never tell us when he would give us a lesson. He would just come into the room, so we better practice eight hours without interruption because he could walk in at any time, at any hour of day or night. What would he say if you weren't actually at the piano when he walked in? Oh, but in? we were. We <laughs> made sure we were. But he would come in and say, you do it all wrong or you, that's not the way to practice and you do it slowly and articulated and whatever. And, and then he would go out again. And um, 
obviously, uh, he would come in and say, now you're ready for lesson, come with me. And then we would go into this beautiful room with this magnificent piano and we would have a lesson that could last 10 minutes or four hours. And how was he as a teacher? Well, he used to say, I didn't invent any system of teaching, and it was quite true. He didn't have a particular school, like uh, you could say the Russian school or such and such, or the French school. He didn't have any of these. He used to say that everything that one looks for is in the score. The only problem is to know how to read the score, and he used to help us. And, to a very rigorous reading of such score. Now, each composer and each score has his own truth. And of course, the more familiar you make yourself with the composer, the more you learn from the other scores. And that is what he was trying to make us understand. The other thing that uh, he used to say, apart from this absolute loyalty to the text, was that the year is the supreme judge of the interpretation and he used to make us uh, either look in that corner and play and listen as if somebody else was playing or close one, our eyes and just listen to our sound and what we were able to produce. What was it like playing for him? Terrifying. Terrifying because he, he really didn't, didn't say very much. He would walk up and down and you could play for a long, long time without him saying a word. And then he would stop and he would make us start again and play perhaps uh, two bars. And I may tell you <laughs> that one time when I brought him Schumann Papillon and I, I was about to start playing and I was half, halfway up in the air and he said troppo forte and that of course scared me already because I didn't even play a note. And on that beginning of that Schumann Papillon we may easily have stayed an hour just how to approach that first note but he wouldn't tell me how to do it. We had to find it for ourselves and when finally we produced the sound that he wanted he would just say echo which means that's it. And at that point started our trouble because we thought, what did I do? I mean, I must have done something okay at this time, <laughs> but how to reproduce it again? And he was so patient. Loretta Conchi's remarks about Michelangelo's extraordinary patience and fastidiousness in matters of touch and tonal weight are borne out by Maurizio Pollini. He spent a year studying with Michelangelo shortly after winning the 1961 Warsaw competition and he remembers well Michelangelo's approach to the opening of Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata. He um, said about the possibility to play it as soft as possible, really, as pianissimo, as uh, indicated by Beethoven, and so difficult to do in this uh, register of the piano, in the bass register, where the piano is unfortunately very loud. And uh, using the mechanic of the piano in a certain way, played in a certain way, it was without, uh, absolutely not staccato, but very near to the keyboard to obtain uh, this mysterious effect that uh, certainly Beethoven wanted. I think he is a great artist and it is certainly one of, of the pianists who were able to play the piano in the most perfect and uh, beautiful, fantastic way. This is uh, for sure about Michelangelo. This is the peak of piano playing together with Horowitz and to very few other people. Everybody knows about his uh, way to playing Ravel, is a performance of Gaspard de la Nuit, I think nobody else played better. Maurizio Pollini. Well, let's hear the master himself in Gaspard de la Nuit. Here's a performance which Michelangeli broadcast live on the BBC Home Service on the night of Tuesday the 30th of June 1959. Arturo Michelangeli recorded live in the BBC Concert Hall in Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit. It's a work like the G major concerto, which ideally suited what one critic dubbed Michelangelo's seismographic gradations of colour and touch and his mesmeric powers of concentration. Well, we move on now to a more controversial area of Michelangelo's repertoire, his playing of Chopin. 
It was in this area that charges were laid against him of unidiomatic distortions and an inability to come to terms with Chopin's Polish roots. These charges are perhaps a bit unfair. Michelangeli had, after all, been chosen in 1949 as the official pianist for the celebrations to mark the centenary of Chopin's death. Two things seem to have distressed his critics most of all. The first was the Italian's apparent coolness, what someone grandly called his poise, which is akin to emotion recollected in tranquillity. The second complaint was the strange way Michelangeli used an old-fashioned device, the technique known as desynchronization of the hands. Carlo Palesi explains the thinking behind this. This was a, a you know a, a normal mean of expression of the old romantic pianists, but he didn't use it to create you know a passionate effect. And that's important because we we can really appreciate the way in which he. He, he could do it with a neoclassic effect, in, in a very, very clear effect. And we, uh, if you listen to, to Bursets by Chopin, played by him, we, we found this uh, unsynchronicity, but, but it's something very, you know, not very passionate. Was his playing sometimes too perfect? Well, I mean, when you hear somebody who really keeps count of everything, you run the risk of thinking he's, you know, he's cold. And there are a lot of ways, a lot of levels at which you can play what is written. And so if you read at this deep level of consciousness and uh, with this professional conscience he had, you had to find that there are a lot of sound plans, there are a lot of things written in the phrasing, and you are forced to have something really perfect, really controlled in every part. I mean, uh, you can't hear Michelangeli, you know, doing something else, uh, chatting, or, or because you have to really to understand what he's doing in the little parts, in the particulars of the music. So you will understand that everything is, uh, you know, is the, the fruit of a very deep artistic and musical personality. I mean, if you play, if you listen to Arthur Rubinstein, with, who has been a great pianist, a great artist, but he's sort of, you know, um, somebody who has got to catch the public f till the first note, somebody who breathes with the public. Michelangeli was somebody who was there, like in, in paradise, staying in another planet and, uh, you know, taking out of the piano the, the, deep, the deep meaning of music and what, of what he could read on the music. That's why maybe you, you can feel or somebody can feel a certain distance between him and the public. But I, I think it's something which doesn't involve the real essence of music. Michelangeli in his explorative, almost otherworldly account of Chopin's Berceurs in D major, Opus 57. That recording, which is available commercially, was made in Italy in 1942. In later years, it seems that Michelangeli became increasingly reluctant to exchange his customary black polo neck for his evening tales, which he referred to as his tutta, or work overalls. This reluctance to appear doesn't seem to have affected him in 1957, a season which, for London audiences at least, was arguably his finest of all. He made that now legendary Rachmaninoff Ravel concerto disc with the Philharmonia Orchestra. He performed Liszt and Beethoven concertos with Sir Malcolm Sargent. He gave a spellbinding recital at the Royal Festival Hall, soon to be released on CD, by the way. And he also found time to come into the BBC studios. In two one-hour sessions, he set down two of Schumann's most demanding scores, Carnival and Fasching's Schwankhaus Wien, or Carnival Jest from Vienna, with which we end today's programme. According to the original contract, the BBC paid him the sum of 225 guineas, inclusive. Quite a tidy sum in those days. It might not have bought him a new Ferrari, but 225 guineas would certainly have furnished Michelangeli with a brand new Morris Oxford. But somehow, I can't quite picture him driving one of those. Radio 3, time now for Mining the Archive. Susan Sharp concludes her two-part exploration of some of the BBC's early recordings of the pianist Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. In today's programme, there are BBC recordings of Beethoven, his Opus 111 sonata, Scarlatti, Chopin, his Funeral March sonata, and the programme ends with Michelangeli's 1957 studio recording of Carnival by Schumann. The programme begins, though, with Grieg, from an Italian radio recording made during the Second World War. 
the fifth of Grieg's lyric pieces, Opus 43, Erotic. It was recorded in 1942 by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, the subject of this week's Mining the Archive. If you heard last week's programme, you'll remember that I spoke then to Michelangeli's pupil and friend, Noreta Conci, and to the Milanese pianist and Michelangeli enthusiast, Carlo Palese. We tried to piece together, as best we could, the conflicting threads in the life of this most enigmatic of men, the mystic, the racing driver who belted up the mountains in his Ferrari, the idealistic and patient teacher who refused to charge his students a penny. Then there was the pianist who'd lock himself away for weeks on end and afterwards find relaxation in the mountain air in the convivial company of the singing men of the Societa Alpinista Tridentini. In today's programme, I'll be talking to Noreta Conci and Maestro Palese again and also to the critic Bryce Morrison as we explore some of the more controversial aspects of Michelangeli's career things such as his notorious cancellations, his ever-diminishing concert repertoire, and lastly, the extraordinary lengths he'd go to in pursuit of his legendary touch and tonal palette. One of the most serious criticisms of Michelangeli's playing was that it lacked real interpretative weight. It was the piano playing of a phenomenal natural talent, but ultimately it was just that and no more. Michelangeli didn't possess a thinking, searching, musical mind. Not surprisingly, this assertion was made most frequently about his playing of the Viennese classical repertory, where it was claimed his playing was arch and lacked any instinctive sense of style. Well, this criticism's probably to miss the point of what Michelangeli was about. But don't let me influence you. Judge the matter for yourself in this 1961 recording of the Mount Everest in any pianist's repertoire. Beethoven's Sonata in C minor, the notorious and problematical Opus 111. The Sonata in C minor, Opus 111 by Beethoven, recorded in the BBC's Maida Vale Studios in May 1961. It was played by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli, who's the subject of this week's Mining the Archive. That Beethoven sonata was one of only two dozen or so works by Mozart, Schubert and Beethoven which Michelangeli was willing to play in public, and then only towards the beginning of his career. But it seems that his musical interests maybe weren't as narrow as his detractors would have us believe, and in fact embraced many works that he never played in public. This point's underlined by many of his pupils, not least Noreta Conci, who remembers well Michelangeli's visits to her parents' home. She became a great friend of my parents. My mother was a concert pianist. And night after night after night, he would sit and play with my mother, who was a better sight reader than myself, or with myself indeed, all the Beethoven symphonies, all the Mozart, the Haydn, the Schubert, everything, four hands. We heard him play just about everything in the repertoire. My mother adored Brahms, so he would play for her all the, that Brahms ever wrote, and uh, Bach and everything, Galuppi, Paradisi, Cimarosa, all the Italian um, of that period. Um, Scarlatti, of course, in masses of it. Noreta Conci, talking there of the late 1940s and 50s, when even in public, Michelangeli's repertoire was rather larger than it eventually became. In this period, he performed concertos regularly with his near-contemporary Carlo Maria Giulini, particularly Mozart concertos. He also played a fair amount of Beethoven, Schumann and Ravel, and an assortment of rarities by Grieg, Albenith and Granados. Later, he was to limit himself to a mere handful or two of works by Chopin, Debussy and Ravel. On the rare occasions when anything unusual did find its way into his programme booklets, he invariably substituted it for something more familiar at the last moment. I asked Carlo Palese why he thought Michelangeli decided to concentrate all his energies on just a few works in this way. What is important is that his development is always in the direction of being more inside the music, always more inside the written sign. So that's that's why it's it's important to look out for the changing of his repertoire. He cut a lot of things just to play, to work on on the same thing for a lot of years just to find every concert something new. And uh, the, the main traits of his 
piano playing, this kind of perspective way of playing every particular of the music in, in, the, in the best way. This stayed and, and went, you know, always more perfect. This unending search for the holy grail of technical and musical perfection, which Carlo Palese talks about, was something which British audiences and critics found difficult to come to terms with. As one critic put it, one went to Michelangelo's recitals always to marvel, but much more rarely to be moved. Michelangelo's relationship with his audiences was rather unorthodox, something we'll touch on later. But it seems likely that even from the start of his career, it was never his intention merely to move them. His mind and fingers were working on a much more exalted plateau, somewhere in a higher stratosphere, as Bryce Morrison explains. People are apt to talk about Michelangelo as this arch perfectionist, but I think it's important to realise that he was concerned with artistic vision, with using his transcendental equipment to illuminate with a unique clarity and originality and force uh, the great masterpieces of music. We've already heard Michelangelo scaling one of the peaks of the Austro-German repertory, so let's hear him now in music by one of the Baroque composers Noretta Conci mentioned a few moments ago. Here he is in four of the Scarlatti sonatas, which he performed along with the Beethoven Opus 111 in that same 1961 BBC recital. Sonatas in C minor, C major, A and B flat major by Domenico Scarlatti, performed there with his characteristic deafness of touch by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. We move now from discussing what Michelangeli played to the way he played it, and first of all to the pianos he used. They were model C and D Steinways, one of which was shipped around the world for his personal use by the Hamburg manufacturer. A great deal of breath has been expended over the years in trying to accuse Michelangeli of doctoring his pianos to create special and unnatural, even dishonest, effects, as if somehow these could lie at the heart of his extraordinary musical and technical imagination. It's true that Michelangeli did take almost pathological steps to ensure that his pianos were exactly as he wanted them. But it's also true that the pianos were themselves perfectly normal Steinways. For the technically minded, I've been assured that they were tuned normally, if maybe a fraction higher than A440, they had a standard action, and they possessed what's known in the business as a perfectly conventional 2 to 5 rate of dispersion in the leverage system. But I'm not sure we need to go into the finer points of that one. Where Michelangeli differed from almost every other pianist was that he employed a full-time piano technician who accompanied him on all his tours, and prepared three or four pianos for him to choose from at each and every concert. The first of these technicians was the celebrated Italian piano manufacturer Cesare Augusto Tallone. To the young Michelangeli, he was a technician, advisor, critic and confidant, all rolled into one. Tallone died some years ago, but Guido Vicari and Angelo Fabrini, his two successors, are still alive. Carlo Palese contacted both of them as part of his research for the Michelangeli commemorative exhibition now on display in his hometown of Brescia. The plain fact emerges from the accounts of both these technicians that Michelangeli's pianos were perfectly normal ones as far as their construction was concerned. What was unusual about them was the extraordinarily fine tolerances to which he had their actions adjusted and the felts of their hammers toned. He had one piano who was personally sended from uh, from Steinway. Uh, usually he found uh, one other or two other pianos, grand pianos on, on the place, uh, who were owned by the association or the hall. And several times also he was sent uh, another new piano from Steinway, let's say, to try it if yeah. he liked. And uh, all the tuners, I mean, he had, uh, were, <laughs> let's say, forced to prepare perfectly all the three or four pianos before he tried them. And he wanted normally, they all confirmed me, uh, a quite soft voicing of the piano because he was able to play sharp with his fingers if he wanted. And uh, he wanted, you know, a sound he could control as best as he could. A sound, you know, to make out with your own fingers. The precise toning of Michelangeli's pianos to suit his style of playing was something which occupied both the pianist and his tuner technician for many hours. BBC producer Willie Robson was lucky enough to have been present at a rehearsal, if that's the right word for it, as Michelangeli prepared for his 1982 Royal Festival Hall recital. I spoke to Willie about Michelangeli's unusual piano technique 
and about his extraordinary pre-concert ritual. He would sit down at the piano because you know there was no one else in the hall the whole day and play a little, and the tuner would then come over and mark some notes which Michelangelo marked on a thing and then take the internal parts of the piano out and tone them exactly the way Michelangelo wanted them and then put them back again. And while he was doing this, Michelangelo paced up and down on the platform. And then he went and played other sections of the music again and you could see that he was listening extremely intently to what was going on and he would mark another couple of notes and the procedure would start again. Now we put our mics up to do a balance test for the recital and we heard all of this all afternoon, almost up until the time of the evening concert. He wasn't feeling terribly well and he had a muffler on in this intense heat in the festival hall. And I still have that image of this man pacing up and down all the time, altering by very small degrees each note on the piano, it seemed like. Well, let's hear something now of Michelangelo's extraordinary tonal range and variety of touch. It's something that he does seem to have cultivated from very early on in his career. This is one of Granados's Spanish dances, and I think you can almost imagine Segovia standing with his guitar in hand, looking over Michelangelo's shoulder. Andaluza, one of Granados' Spanish dances, recorded by Michelangelo in London in 1948. We move now to something which is as much part of the Michelangelo legend as were his so-called desynchronizing of the hands and his famous black handkerchief. I'm talking about his notorious last-minute cancellations, of which he'd made something of a speciality. Even with the concert hall jam-packed, he'd contrive, especially in later years, to find some pretext to avoid appearing before his public. Often his cancellations would be due to illness, probably genuine as often as not, or a problem with the humidity which he felt affected both himself and his piano, hence the notorious announcement at one of London's concert halls that Maestro Michelangeli does not appear when it's raining. On occasions, these excuses could assume almost farcical proportions. For example, he cancelled his last scheduled concert in London when he heard that Italian tour operators had been buying tickets after he'd specifically stipulated that he did not wish for tickets to be sold to groups of Italians. He felt apparently that the Italian people were no longer capable of appreciating music properly and that furthermore, he did not wish his concerts to be marketed like football matches. Clearly it was unrealistic to expect any concert hall to honour his wishes even if they were legally entitled to do so. The truth at the core of these cancellations and probably also at his paring down of his repertoires, very simple. He had an almost mystical hatred of anything less than perfection, and this, combined with the expectations of his fans, engendered in him an almost pathological fear of performing in public. Bryce Morrison and Noreta Conchi proffered their own interesting variants on this theme. His, his greatest hate was the adulation of his followers. You see, his uh, perfectionism, of which we all know, uh, was a kind of ascetic consecration. And without that, he would just prefer not to, not to perform. That was the, the reason why he, he cancelled so many concerts, because he felt, either physically or whatever, that he couldn't give uh, all that he knew he could. And therefore, he, he just cancelled. As a concert pianist, then you are a public figure, and I think this peculiar paradox of the private man who is a public artist immediately creates a, a neurotic tension for some people. I think there is also perhaps the feeling that deep down people expect something immense from you, and some nights you can do it, and other nights because you're a human being and not a robot you can't. And I think Michelangelo was conscious that people expected him to sound like a god in music, and some nights you could sound like perhaps a rather ordinary human being, and then there's a sense of letdown and so on. One of the works Michelangelo played most often was Chopin's sonata in B-flat minor, the Funeral March sonata. This work seems to suit perfectly his almost morbid quest for tonal and expressive perfection, which Bryce Morrison was mentioning there. Here's Michelangeli in a performance of the sonata recorded in 1959. Chopin's Sonata in B-flat minor, recorded in the BBC Concert Hall in 1959. Two years earlier, Michelangeli had paid a spectacularly successful visit to London, 
and for many, the year 1957 is seen as the Michelangeli Annus Mirabilis. Michelangeli had recently recovered from a serious lung infection, and he returned after a number of years' absence in astonishing form. He'd only just begun the process of pruning his repertoire and that fine-tuning of his interpretations, which reached its zenith in his 1982 London concerts. We hope to bring you these performances in a later edition of Mining the Archive. But for the moment, I'll end this two-part look at the life and career of Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli with his remarkable 1957 account of Schumann's Carnival. It was captured in the BBC Concert Hall and the 37-year-old pianist was at his inspirational best. My thanks are due to Noreta Conci and to Carlo Palese for their help in steering me through the various stages of Michelangeli's career. I'd also like to thank Bryce Morrison at this stage. But before that, I'd like to put just two questions to him, which I've been burning to ask all along. Where does Bryce place Michelangeli in his personal pantheon of pianists? And what exactly does he think it was that Alfred Corto first detected in the young Michelangeli's playing at that Geneva competition of 1939? This was the occasion when Corto so famously declared that a new list is born, a pronouncement which launched Michelangeli on his singular, solitary musical quest. Corto um, knew a great pianist when he heard one, and he was enormously enthusiastic about Michelangeli. And it is very interesting that Corto, whose playing was bedeviled with inaccuracies and memory lapses and so on, could appreciate a very different type of quest for a certain type of perfection, pianistically speaking, in, in other artists. And I think he heard in Michelangelo not only that, that pianistic perfection, but also underneath this uh, single-mindedness of, of a truly great artist. He had the ability of any very great artist, one of the few great artists in each generation, to make you literally forget about any other pianist and for you to feel that you were hearing the ultimate Schumann Carnival or the ultimate B-flat minor Chopin Sonata or whatever. For some time afterwards, you could not think about anyone else. And therefore, that put him in a sort of parthenon of, of the, a completely transcendental artist when he was at his greatest. I would count Michelangelo amongst the very greatest pianists of all time. Schumann's Carnival, recorded in the BBC Concert Hall by Arturo Benedetti Michelangeli. And that brings to an end Susan Sharp's two-part exploration of the life and career of the Italian pianist. In next week's Mining the Archive, the presenter will be the pianist Philip Folk, and he'll be mining the BBC's collection of recordings made at the Queen's Hall. Among the recordings he'll be introducing is one of Toscanini, conducting the whole of the Dies Irae from the Verdi Requiem. That's Mining the Archive at its usual time, 3 o'clock next Friday afternoon. <laughs>